What's the scariest or strangest thing you've seen in a national park or national forest? Part 4. Get comfy and enjoy the show if you're into it. Smash that subscribe button and spread the word about Thread Tonic. Account 1. Last summer I was walking along a dirt road in Dixie National Forest. I noticed a lean-to shelter when I came around a bend in the road. It didn't seem inhabited at the time, so I looked into the open end facing away from the road. Yeah, there was a homeless person masturbating inside it. Utah's really wild, man. Account 2. I'm a wetland biologist in Pennsylvania. I was in an area that was getting some restoration work done, and I was flagging and mapping some wetland boundaries. There was an old farm reservoir that was being fed by a system of seeps and springs at the base of the mountain, so I was walking up to trace them back. Suddenly, as I came over the hill, there was what looked like a small hunting camp or maybe a homeless hideout. Old, rusted-out furniture, a refrigerator, tuna cans, chewing tobacco cans, and a bunch of natty light beer. Whatever. Not uncommon in public lands that used to be private. Just as I turned around, there was a very well-cleaned and large German shepherd. Great, now I'm screwed, is what I was thinking and readied my shovel handle to defend myself. The dog turned around and looked at me as if it wanted me to follow it. Now I'm thinking it's obviously someone's dog and maybe it's trying to get me to help. I followed the dog further up the hill, past the camp, and smack in the middle of the woods there were 20-30 old ratty dolls buried up to their necks with their arms pointed up and towards a large deer carcass looped up into the tree. I turned around and walked back to the reservoir and then out of the woods and back to the truck. I was getting married in a month. I wasn't prepared to deal with someone being sacrificed or trying to sacrifice me. About a six-mile hike off of 119 on I-81S, job's done, never going back. Count three. I live next to two national forests' parks. From June to July, there was a horrific fire that prompted evacuations. My family had about three hours to pack anything of value. Luckily, we didn't end up having to evacuate. I had just gotten off work and so had my dad. I told them we should really consider evacuating. They didn't take my advice at first, but then we saw the mountain burning. First thing I did was get all of our legal documents, birth certificates, medical files, etc. That took about half an hour. Next, I helped my sister pack and get through her panic attacks. She was eight at the time. It was absolutely heart-wrenching having to tell her that we couldn't take all of her stuffed animals, and she had to pack only a few. I had to talk her out of only bringing her stuffed animals. I ended up packing a lot for her because she was just so sad. She ended up settling on a few of her favorites, and an elephant stuffed animal she got from an ambulance when she was four. Next, I checked on my other sister. She was oddly calm. She packed everything she wanted into a small bag, and that was it. I went to help my parents, but they told me to go pack my stuff. I ended up packing some expensive stuff, like my purse collection. I also packed important items and my artwork, and then had a mental breakdown. It was summer, and I was on the top floor. I ended up overheating, and yeah, it was bad. Next was packing animal stuff. At the time, we had 12 hens, 2 guinea pigs, and 2 dogs. We packed food for everyone and started getting stuff together. Harnesses, water bottles, food, bedding, hay, etc. By now the fire was halfway down the mountain. I grabbed the guinea pigs and put them in their transport cage. Put them by the door. My dad took a trailer from his boss. I wasn't allowed to help take anything outside as I have life-threatening asthma and it would have been bad. Anyway, we eventually got everything moved, taken out, and by then it was night. The fire had gotten to the base of the mountain on one side. We were all exhausted. I asked my parents if we could leave, but they said not yet. I have no idea how I fell asleep. But my sisters and I all slept next to the front door that night. It was very mesmerizing. I have no idea why, but I was in a trance. It was midnight, but the flames from the burning mountain lit up the sky. It was eerie and haunting, almost beautiful. The orange flames, purple smoke, and moonlight. Awful to say, I know, but it was like a painting. Anyway, about 2 a.m., I woke up. The mountain was still burning, but the thousand-foot flames were completely gone. I woke everyone up, and we were all so grateful. A few of us were crying from joy. Several local fire departments had set up a fire line that night. That's what saved us. In the end, nobody died. A local firefighter was severely burned, but he's since recovered and is attending physical therapy. He was released from the hospital about a month or two ago.
The night before we were prepping for evacuation, a bucket helicopter crashed. Again, nobody died. One house and several government buildings were burned. In total, about 35,000 acres were burned. That's the most horrific thing I've ever seen, though. I think the reason we were so affected by this is because we have had a house fire before. We were so lucky that this time we got to pack and rescue our animals. Rip Lady, you were the best lil' dog. Also a Rippy Thunder. My poor bird passed away from a horrible accident. Rip Rex, our fox, I work at an animal sanctuary, who died of heat stroke and heart attack from the fire. You'll all be missed. Account 4. In San Francisco, California, there is an amazing park you can pay to go into. It's an amusement park with different sections planted with natural trees from different countries. To be in Japan and then walk further to find yourself suddenly in Africa is pretty weird and breathtaking at the same time. Highly recommend this place. Account 5. I was camping in Grand Teton National Park at Coulter Bay Campground right by Jackson Lake. My buddies and I just turned in for the night around 1 a.m. Right as I was drifting asleep, I heard the most guttural animal scream. It sounded like one animal was attacking another. This went on for a few minutes. It sounded more feline than a bear, but I'm no expert. I quietly whispered, You heard that, right? And both my friends responded, Yup. Then we pretended like it didn't happen so we could actually get some sleep and had to camp there for a few more nights. We were camping in some of the farthest back campsites they had, and we didn't have anyone camping in the sites next to us, diagonally or straight across. We were basically alone. For sure unnerving, but that's why we had a hatchet and bear spray in the tent. Count six. I was at Redwood National Park, looking at a tree, obviously. I walked up to the base of the tree, sizing it up. I had never seen a California redwood in person before. It was awe-inspiring. Above me, I heard the sound of crackling branches and leaves, and all of a sudden, before I could look up, three feet away from me, crash. A branch the size of a ladder smashed into the ground. Not a huge piece of wood, but it impacted the ground with enough force for me to realize I wouldn't have been able to walk out of that park. Made me appreciate things a bit more intimately. Account 7. People. It is always people. I couldn't put my finger on one event, but if you are a hiker or backpacker, there is always a little unease seeing someone when you have not passed another soul in hours. 99% of folks are amazing, but there is always a weird sense of being outside of the constraints of society when you are that isolated. It makes you aware that if this person was an axe murderer, relying on the fact that it would be illegal to axe you in broad daylight is tragically less important than it is in your day-to-day -day life. I assume it feels somewhat like what life in the early American West was like. People also do things on the trail which make sense, but would strike you as a warning sign in different circumstances. I know lots of people who sing to themselves or hang bells on their packs when hiking in bear country to avoid startling any mamas. Add to that that you may not have showered in a day or two. You probably look a little frayed around the edges if you have been out for a few days, etc. Suddenly your city senses are telling you this is a potentially dangerous person and you should be careful. Sprinkle in a healthy dose of how did this person get here when you know the area and it does not make sense that you would not have passed them before, finish with a light coat of I am in a weird mental place because it is 2 p.m. and I have not spoken to another human yet today. And you have got a recipe for all kinds of paranormal stuff. God, I love hiking. Account 8. I have run into grizzly bears twice on a trail when rounding a blind corner come within 20-30 feet accidentally. Way too close. Neither bear could have given any sort of damn I was there, thank God. The smaller of the two was an adolescent male, maybe 250 pounds. He was foraging and enjoying a good day and hardly gave me a glance. The other was a big female with two cubs. The cubs were each like St. Bernard's. But it is the moose that are the scariest. A giant, jacked, ugly, perpetually pissed off, forest-dwelling horse wearing the world's biggest hat rack on its head. Give them all the distance you would give an angry bear. These guys are always angry and looking for someone to stomp into jelly. I was also in Glacier Park. Got out of my car in a parking lot, and this ram sent me right back inside. He was huge and solid muscle. If he rammed a person, they would just come apart. Count nine. 6 a.m. in Yellowstone. My husband and I are hiking essentially alone in a gorgeous part of the park, and we suddenly hear this insane drumming. 
It is so loud it rumbles the ground beneath us and sounds like a boulder tumbling from a height, picking up speed. We end up back to back with our bear spray out because we have never heard this sound before and legitimately cannot place it. I, of course, think it is a bear, having never encountered one or heard its growl. It is a motherfucking ruffled grouse, a chicken-sized bird that can flap its wings and make a loud beat to find girls. We ended up seeing another couple later who told us what it was. Can't tell you how sheepish we both were looking back on us wide-eyed and terrified over a forest chicken. Account 10. Back in 2010, I was doing a solo bike camping trip through the Gifford Pinchot National Forest in Washington State. Doing a backroads trip from Portland to Seattle using the Baby Shoe Pass route if you are familiar with the area. One day I was near Big Tire Junction and looking for a campsite. My plan was generally to find a random jeep trail and follow it until I saw a good campsite. The first trail I tried I ran into a bear so I rang my bike bell a bunch and scared it away. I turned around to find a new trail. I eventually did and found a good spot on a random jeep trail about 50 miles from the closest human habitation. I was at about 4,200 feet, so the mosquitoes were horrible. I had not brought a tent, so I crawled into my bag around 8.30 for some respite. Maybe 20 minutes after I went to bed, I heard an engine. I peeked my head out and saw a truck driving down the trail. I locked eyes with the guy driving it, and he passed my camp and disappeared a bit down the road. I pulled out my map and confirmed that the trail I was on ended after descending the canyon for a mile or two. What is this guy doing? Why is he here so far from literally anything? Then I realized there were two humans on planet Earth who knew where I was. Me and this guy doing God knows what in the middle of a giant forest an hour away from any town or main road. Holy shit. I was pretty freaked but ended up staying put. 30 minutes later he came back up the trail, drove past me and vanished. I had a hard time sleeping that night as I was nervous about the bear and the weirdo but nothing happened. The next night, I camped at an abandoned campground near Taklok Lake. Despite a massive berm placed by the Forest Service, some yahoos arrived and proceeded to get wild and drunk and started blasting away with their guns. They definitely did not know I was there. Again, I hunkered down and woke up at 5 a.m. the next morning to slip out before they woke up. Weird trip, but damn do I miss having the kind of life where I could spend a week riding a bike in the woods alone. Account 11. Definitely a caterwauling barred owl in the middle of the night while camping in Shenandoah. Close second would be a bull elk bugle, also middle of the night, in Grand Canyon National Park. Sleeping in my hammock had me feeling very defenseless after having heard these eerie sounds. Account 12. I live in New Mexico. My dad loves hunting and was even a hunting guide for elk half of my life. We were hunting in southern NM and got back to camp the first night and started making dinner. Mountain spaghetti hits different. Strongly recommend. It was super dark, but we had a fire and headlamps, etc. It was about 9 p.m. and my dad had a baseball game playing over the radio. My cousin and I, myself being 10 and him being 12, heard just beyond our camp out in the trees this horrible wailing sound. It was super low in pitch at first, but bounced around as it progressed. It got closer and closer, taking brief pauses in between each wailing episode. When it's dark and your mind races in the mountains, being literal children, we thought we were dead. My dad grabbed a rifle, and considering he's been in the mountains his entire life, that was enough to make us run for the truck. My dad looked at us and said, If I don't come back, lock the doors. Well, he was messing with us and it happened to be a group of wild horses that were pissed off because our camp inconvenienced them from their walking path. Another time, my dad and I were walking through the woods, and under a tree, a grouse bird was hanging out. We definitely startled it walking up behind it, and when it started flapping its wings, it sounded like a helicopter right next to us. I, again, thought we were dead. Account 13. Went hiking in a small local state park when I was probably eight or nine. Pretty fall morning with nothing but squirrels and fresh air. About an hour into the hike, we stopped to rest, and I wandered a little distance away. Saw an unusual-looking pile of leaves with a glint of white. Went to look, and it was a skeleton of a kid my age. Dad and me noped the heck out and called the police. They had us take them up to the site, asked us some questions, and sent us home. Dad tried a couple of times to call them for follow-up, but all we found out was the skeleton was human. 
I hope whoever the kid was got their name back and their family got an answer. Account 14. About 10 humans rushing a full-grown bear for photographs in Yellowstone. Stopped all traffic. Vacated cars in the middle of the road. I was sure someone was going to get clawed. Lucky for them, the bear must have been conditioned to it and fled into the woods. My faith in mankind dipped a lot that day. Account 15. When I was on a school trip, we were staying in cabins inside a national park. In the morning, we heard the girls screaming, so we ran outside to see the weird kid standing in front of the girls' cabin completely naked with a frog that he hunted, which was still alive, impaled on a stick. The crazy thing is that there were no consequences to what he did. Account 16. I was canoeing a river in Texas and saw no fewer than three cottonmouths in a tree overhanging the water. I do not usually mind snakes, but the idea of a venomous little bugger just dropping into your canoe is basically like being trapped in a closet with it. But every time you move, the floor moves under you. Account 17. When I was about 10, I was in the Smoky Mountains with my mom and aunt. We went on a trail that was called Rainbow Falls, a fairly easy trail, and my boredom kicked in halfway through. I could tell that the trail turned right up ahead. Then I noticed I could climb a little hill and run into the trail on the other side. So I climbed up this hill and I was probably 100 meters off trail when up ahead, 20 feet in front of me, two huge bucks raised up on their hind legs then slammed their antlers together in a battle for dominance. I froze in place, scared they might see me and both decide, no, forget that little dude, 